Welcome back. Today we are going to immerse ourselves in the foundations of Chinese civilization, starting with the ancient period, to the classical empires, and into the post-classical period. So let's review. First, agricultural civilizations emerged in the Yellow River Valley, or the Huanghe River Valley, and also the Yangtze River Valley to the south during ancient times. I'm talking before the year zero. However, early dynasties weren't able to create centralized rule on a large scale. Uh, in these periods of ancient Chinese history, they had the Warring States period, where, check this, different states warred against each other. Now, you may recall that the Qin Dynasty ended the Warring States period using the philosophy of legalism, super strict rules and harsh punishments to create an orderly civilization. But no one really likes to live under a government that you're afraid of and fear for your life, that they might amputate your feet or cut off your nose or remove your kneecap. Yep, those all happened. And those are situations where the person actually lived. Other people under Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi lost their head, were burned alive, or even dismembered super slowly. Luckily, this dynasty ended and a new philosophy focusing on Confucian principles emerged. Education, filial piety, respect for authority were values of Confucianism. No god or deity was really the focus of Confucianism as it was more of a philosophy. And this ushered in a golden age of the Han Dynasty where they created a centralized government that expanded and lasted for over 400 years. Punishments were way more humane, where corporal punishments like floggings and beatings were used versus losing arms or feet. However, without getting into too many descriptive details, a continued practice of castration continued in China. I wasn't really going to be giving you a birds and the beasts lesson, but castration is where they remove a certain part of a male's private areas uh, to prevent them from reproducing. And sometimes, based on different crimes, they would do that. And obviously there is no anesthesia. So during the Han Dynasty, this act of castration was a punishment, but it was also used on enslaved children of conquered neighboring areas. And the enslaved child would be castrated and then would be a servant in the palace. They were known as eunuchs or non-men. They were regarded as the most trustworthy because they could neither seduce women of the household or be involved in creating children that might challenge the dynastic rule of the emperor. Now, the Han Dynasty falls for a variety of reasons, one of them being these eunuchs gaining a lot of power in the palace and then challenging rule. They also overextended their empire, they struggled with nomadic invaders, and were unable to defend their border, which they took from other people. But either way, additionally, they had economic problems, plague, civil unrest. China then entered a period of regionalism, once again for about 300 years, much like the Warring States period. Buddhism spread into the region from the Silk Road and grew in its practice, but Confucian values still embodied much of China. Today, Chinese children often learn this saying that goes, Qin Han, Sui Tong. And it doesn't really feel that profound, but essentially what happened in the Qin and Han dynasties will look so very similar to what happened in the Sui and Tong dynasties. After this period of regionalism, a strict legalistic rulers known as Sui Wendi, much like Qin Shi Huangdi, will come along. Legalism was back. Emperor Wendi put in really harsh punishments and thought that a lot of times they were too light beforehand and made them be even stricter than the law was there for. And if you stole something, he increased the punishment all the way to death. Legalism. Now, I once stole an eraser in third grade, and I could still feel the hot sweats I felt when I went back to my classroom after stealing that eraser, because that guilt was enough punishment for me. But during the legalistic Sway dynasty, I wouldn't have even been here today if I was apprehended for that silly eraser. Now, Emperor Wendy wasn't all law and order, or rather, our law is too weak, so let's bring on intense punishment. He was actually Buddhist, which is a little ironic in that the goal of Buddhism is to end suffering and desire, to reach enlightenment. But he spread the religion of Buddhism throughout China. Remember, it originated in India and then came through the Silk Roads. He focused on building an elaborate bureaucracy and established the really big empire once again in the name, like this, of Buddhism, much like Ashoka did in India. 
He was most famous for his projects, such as the Grand Canal. The Yellow River and the Yangtze River, although not straight, uh, kind of flow this way, and the canal connected the two. It was over a thousand miles long. That would be like driving from Wisconsin, where I live, all the way to the Dakotas. Or if you're in San Diego, it's like driving all the way from San Diego all the way to Oregon. So let's remember, there's no mechanical equipment, though, to build this Grand Canal. So people were literally digging it with their hands and with their tools that they had. He also moved the capital city to modern-day Xi'an, at this time known as Chang'an. Now, while Sui Wendi didn't die because he sought immortality, much like Qin Shi Huangdi did, some accounts say that his son strangled him, which, yikes, it's a little family drama there. Uh, his son then ruled after his death, whether that happened or not, and then his son was also assassinated. The bottom line is this, the Sui dynasty used legalism, and it unified them back into an empire, and dynastic rule continued. After the assassinations here, we move into another part of the Tang dynasty, if we remember, Qin Han, Sui Tang. And the Tang dynasty was a long golden age, much like the Han dynasty, using Confucian values to rule the empire. The empire will then be expanded all the way down to Vietnam in the south, up to Mongolia in the north, and then west into Central Asia. The Tang Dynasty will utilize a tribute system where surrounding kingdoms basically could make payments of goods or food or money, also known as tribute, and then submit to the rule of the superior Tang Dynasty in exchange for basically allowing them to trade or just be able to rule their own land. This type of system really helped unify under the Han Dynasty as well, and it was utilized once again during the Tang. A new technological innovation was champa rice, which was this fast ripening rice that allowed them to have multiple harvests a year. A famous AP World-ism is the idea that more food equals more people, and they could sustain and feed a larger population with this reality of two seasons of rice or more. They also expanded the civil service exam, which is how people got into government service during the Tang Dynasty. Also, new inventions emerged, like gunpowder and paper, both things that really helped bring strength to the Tang Dynasty, as well as the iconic silk that they traded along the Silk Road. We can see how similar these early dynasties were in China. Qin Han, Sui Tang. Qin, short and legalistic, which was followed by a long golden age of the Han Dynasty, focusing on Confucian values with new inventions, wealth, and trade. Sui, short and legalistic, followed by a long golden age focused on Confucianism, new inventions, wealth, and trade. So from river valley civilizations to the golden ages of the Han and the Tang Dynasty, China is only going to keep growing. We have so much more to learn as we continue on the journey of all the dynasties of China. Song, Wan, Ming, and then into the modern context of the Republic and the emergence of communism in China. Before you're done, you'll know it all. So thanks for tuning in. Hit the like button if you've learned something new today. Or check out these other videos about classical civilizations and the post-classical era. Thanks for joining.